Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, now, from deep in the darkest forests of northern Minnesota, the show you waited for. This is Grizzly's Loud, and I am honored to present our host, the man, the mystery, the legend, this is Grizzly. Hello again. So, I am doing this really quick and dirty because I wanted to get something up and running, and it's been so damn long since I have. Well, I read a lot of Twitter, and I was reading Twitter one day, and somebody mentioned that folks are once again talking about what a wonderful idea eugenics is. And there, of course, there are plenty of ideas out there that are somewhat derivative from eugenics. Um, eugenics really derives from elitism. And I have found, with uh, no exceptions I have personally met, that people who believe and support uh, elitism either believe that they are in the elite or believe that someday they're going to be in the elites. They want the rich to have power because someday they're going to be rich. They're perfectly fine if a disease only affects the old and sick because they do not believe themselves to be old and sick or their family, or their relatives. Well, it wouldn't apply to us. Anyway, G.K. Chesterton said it a lot better in uh, Eugenics and Other Evils, so I'm going to let him do that. I'm going to re-podcast Eugenics in its entirety, and I thought it was rather well done in the first place, so I'm not really going to change anything. And I'm going to put it on the uh, Grizzlies Growls feed, because technically speaking, I'm still doing... The uh, Federalist Papers on the hibernation feed. And please note that this is the version I originally did for patiobooks.com. It does mention patiobooks frequently, but uh, just remember that this is all going to be off of grizzliesgrowls.com. So enjoy something I did back in 2010, Eugenics and Other Evils, G.K. Chesterton. Episode 1 Eugenics and Other Evils by G. K. Chesterton Read by David Grizzly Smith Narrator's Introduction For the next few paragraphs I'll speak for myself to set the stage for G. K. Chesterton's book and to suggest why I believe it is still an important book. I think G. K. Chesterton explains his book rather well in his introduction, but it might help to start with a sense of the time in question. Chesterton started work on eugenics and other evils in about 1910, but it was not completed and published until 1922. Now, in his own introduction, he talks about the period before and after the war. Of course, the war he refers to is now called World War I. We now have a distaste for the word eugenics, largely driven by events in World War II. But at the time this book was published, eugenics was lauded to the skies as a wonderful idea, and Chesterton was nearly the only person saying in writing that eugenics was, in fact, evil. A case could be made, and has been made, that today, though the word eugenics is avoided, Some practices that are in fact eugenic practices and some sciences that are in fact eugenic sciences enjoy great popularity and engender great public enthusiasm. To which practices and which sciences I refer is left as an exercise for the reader. Now I'll let Mr. Chesterton speak for himself. To the reader, I publish these essays at the present time for a particular reason connected with the present situation, a reason which I should like briefly to emphasize and make clear. Though most of the conclusions, especially towards the end, are conceived with reference to recent events, the actual bulk of preliminary notes about the science of eugenics were written before the war. 
It was a time when this theme was the topic of the hour, when eugenic babies, not visibly very distinguishable from other babies, sprawled all over the illustrated papers, when the evolutionary fancy of Nietzsche was the new cry among the intellectuals, and when Mr. Bernard Shaw and others were considering the idea that to breed a man like a cart horse was the true way to attain that higher civilization of intellectual magnanimity and sympathetic insight which may be found in cart horses. It may therefore appear that I took the opinion too controversially, and it seems to me that I sometimes took it too seriously. But the criticism of eugenics soon expanded of itself into a more general criticism of a modern craze for scientific officialism and strict social organization. And then the hour came when I felt, not without relief, that I might well fling all my notes into the fire. The fire was a very big one, and was burning up bigger things than such pedantic quackeries. And anyhow, the issue itself was being settled in a very different style. Scientific officialism and organization in the state which had specialized in them had gone to war with the older culture of Christendom. Either Prussianism would win, and the protest would be hopeless, or Prussianism would lose, and the protest would be needless. As the war advanced from poison gas to piracy against neutrals, it grew more and more plain that the scientifically organized state was not increasing in popularity. Whatever happened, no Englishman would ever again go nosing round the stinks of that low laboratory. So I thought all I had written irrelevant and put it out of my mind. I am greatly grieved to say that it is not irrelevant. It has gradually grown apparent to my astounded gaze that the ruling classes in England are still proceeding on the assumption that Prussia is a pattern for the whole world. If parts of my book are nearly nine years old, most of their principles and proceedings are a great deal older. They can offer us nothing but the same stuffy science, the same bullying bureaucracy, and the same terrorism by tenth-rate professors that have led the German Empire to its recent conspicuous triumph. For that reason, three years after the war with Prussia, I collect and publish these papers. G. K. C. Part 1. The False Theory Chapter 1. What is Eugenics? The wisest thing in the world is to cry out before you are hurt. It is no good to cry out after you are hurt, especially after you are mortally hurt. People talk about the impatience of the populace, but sound historians know that most tyrannies have been possible because men moved too late. It is often essential to resist a tyranny before it exists. It is no answer to say, with a distant optimism, that the scheme is only in the air. A blow from a hatchet can only be parried while it is in the air. There exists today a scheme of action, a school of thought, as collective and unmistakable as any of those by whose grouping alone we can make any outline of history. It is as firm a fact as the Oxford Movement, or the Puritans of the Long Parliament, or the Jansenists, or the Jesuits. It is a thing that can be pointed out. It is a thing that can be discussed, and it is a thing that can still be destroyed. It is called, for convenience, eugenics, and that it ought to be destroyed, I propose to prove in the pages that follow. I know that it means very different things to different people, but that is only because evil always takes advantage of ambiguity. I know that it is praised with high professions of idealism and benevolence, with silver-tongued rhetoric about purer motherhood and a happier posterity. But that is only because evil is always flattered, as the Furies were called the Gracious Ones. 
I know that it numbers many disciples whose intentions are entirely innocent and humane, and who would be sincerely astonished at my describing it as I do. But that is only because evil always wins through the strength of its splendid dupes. And there has in all ages been a disastrous alliance between abnormal innocence and abnormal sin." Of these who are deceived, I shall speak, of course, as we all do of such instruments, judging them by the good they think they are doing, not by the evil which they really do. But eugenics itself does exist, for those who have sense enough to see that ideas exist, and eugenics itself, in large quantities or small, coming quickly or coming slowly, urged from good motives or bad, applied to a thousand people or applied to three, eugenics itself is a thing no more to be bargained about than poisoning. It is not really difficult to sum up the essence of eugenics though some of the eugenists seem rather vague about it. The movement consists of two parts, a moral basis, which is common to all, and a scheme of social application which varies a good deal. For the moral basis, it is obvious that man's ethical responsibility varies with his knowledge of consequences. If I were in charge of a baby, like Dr. Johnson in that Tower of Vision, and if the baby was ill, through having eaten the soap, I might possibly send for a doctor. I might be calling him away from much more serious cases, from the bedsides of babies whose diet had been far more deadly. But I should be justified. I could not be expected to know enough about his other patients to be obliged or even entitled to sacrifice to them the baby for whom I was primarily and directly responsible. Now, the eugenic moral basis is this, that the baby for whom we are primarily and directly responsible is the babe unborn. That is, we know, or may come to know, enough of certain inevitable tendencies in biology to consider the fruit of some contemplated union in that direct and clear light of conscience which we can now only fix on the other partner in that union. The one duty can conceivably be as definite as, or more definite than, the other. The baby that does not exist can be considered even before the wife, who does. Now it is essential to grasp that this is a comparatively new note in morality. Of course, sane people always thought the aim of marriage was the procreation of children, to the glory of God, or according to the plan of nature. But whether they counted such children as God's reward for service or nature's premium on sanity, they always left the reward to God or the premium to nature as a less definable thing. The only person, and this is the point, towards whom one could have precise duties was the partner in the process. Directly considering the partner's claims was the nearest one could get to indirectly considering the claims of posterity. If the women of the harem sang praises of the hero as the Moslem mounted his horse, it was because this was the due of a man. If the Christian knight helped his wife off her horse, it was because this was the due of a woman. Definite and detailed dues of this kind they did not predicate of the babe unborn regarding him in that agnostic and opportunist light in which Mr. Brody regarded the hypothetical child of Miss Squeers. Thinking these sex relations healthy, they naturally hoped they would produce healthy children. But that was all. The Moslem woman doubtless expected Allah to send beautiful sons to the obedient wife, but she would not have allowed any direct vision of such sons to alter the obedience itself. She would not have said, I will now be a disobedient wife, as the learned leech informs me that great prophets are often the children of disobedient wives. The knight doubtless hoped the saints would help him to strong children, if he did all the duties of his station, one of which might be helping his wife off her horse. But he would not have refrained from doing this, because he had read in a book that a course of falling off horses often resulted in the birth of a genius. 
Both Muslim and Christian would have thought such speculations not only impious, but utterly impractical. I quite agree with them, but that is not the point here. The point here is that a new school believes eugenics against ethics. And it is proved by one familiar fact, that the heroisms of history are actually the crimes of eugenics. The eugenists' books and articles are full of suggestions that non-eugenic unions should and may come to be regarded as we regard sins, that we should really feel that marrying an invalid is a kind of cruelty to children. But history is full of the praises of people who have held sacred such ties to invalids, of cases like those of Colonel Hutchinson and Sir William Temple, who remained faithful to betrothals when beauty and health had been apparently blasted. And though the illnesses of Dorothy Osborne and Mrs. Hutchinson may not fall under the eugenic speculations, I do not know, it is obvious that they might have done so, and certainly it would not have made any difference to the men's moral opinion of the act. I do not discuss here which morality I favor, but I insist that they are opposite. The eugenist really sets up as saints the very men whom hundreds of families have called sneaks. To be consistent, they ought to put up statues to the men who deserted their loves because of bodily misfortune, with inscriptions celebrating the good eugenist who, on his fiancée falling off a bicycle, nobly refused to marry her, or to the young hero who, on hearing of an uncle with erysipelas, magnanimously broke his word. What is perfectly plain is this, that mankind have hitherto held the bond between man and woman so sacred, and the effect of it on the children so incalculable, that they have always admired the maintenance of honor more than the maintenance of safety. Doubtless they thought that even the children might be none the worse for not being the children of cowards and shirkers, but this was not the first thought, the first commandment. Briefly, we may say that while many moral systems have set restraints on sex almost as severe as any eugenist could set, they have almost always had the character of securing the fidelity of the two sexes to each other and leaving the rest to God. To introduce an ethic which makes that fidelity or infidelity vary with some calculation about heredity is that rarest of all things, a revolution that has not happened before. It is only right to say here, though the matter should only be touched on, that many eugenists would contradict this, insofar as to claim that there was a consciously eugenic reason for the horror of those unions which began with the celebrated denial to man of the privilege of marrying his grandmother. Dr. S. R. Steinmetz, with that creepy simplicity of mind with which the eugenists chill the blood, remarks that we do not yet know quite certainly what were the motives for the horror of that horrible thing which is the agony of Oedipus. With entirely amiable intention, I ask Dr. S. R. Steinmetz to speak for himself. I know the motives for regarding a mother or sister as separate from other women, nor have I reached them by any curious researches. I found them where I found an analogous aversion to eating a baby for breakfast. I found them in a rooted detestation in the human soul to liking a thing in one way when you already like it in another quite incompatible way. Now, it is perfectly true that this aversion may have acted eugenically, and so had a certain ultimate confirmation and basis in the laws of procreation, but there really cannot be any eugenist quite so dull as not to see that this is not a defense of eugenics, but a direct denial of eugenics. If something which has been discovered at last 
by the lamp of learning is something which has been acted on from the first by the light of nature, this, so far as it goes, is plainly not an argument for pestering people, but an argument for letting them alone. If men did not marry their grandmothers when it was, for all they knew, a most hygienic habit, if we know now that they instinctively avoided scientific peril, that, so far as it goes, is a point in favor of letting people marry anyone they like. It is simply the statement that sexual selection, or what Christians call falling in love, is a part of man which, in the rough and in the long run, can be trusted. And that is the destruction of the whole of this science at a blow. The second part of the definition, the persuasive or coercive methods to be employed, I shall deal with more fully in the second part of this book. But some such summary as the following may here be useful. Far into the unfathomable past of our race we find the assumption that the founding of a family is the personal adventure of a free man. Before slavery sank slowly out of sight under the new climate of Christianity, it may or may not be true that slaves were in some sense spread like cattle, valued as a promising stock for labor. If it was so, it was so in a much looser and vaguer sense than the breeding of the eugenists, and such modern philosophers read into the old paganism a fantastic pride and cruelty which are wholly modern. It may be, however, that pagan slaves had some shadow of the blessings of the eugenists' care. It is quite certain that the pagan freemen would have killed the first man that suggested it, I mean suggested it seriously, for Plato was only a Bernard Shaw who unfortunately made all his jokes in Greek. Among free men, the law, more often the creed, most commonly of all the custom, have laid all sorts of restrictions on sex for this reason or that, but law and creed and custom have never concentrated heavily except upon fixing and keeping the family, once it had been made. The act of founding the family, I repeat, was an individual adventure outside the frontiers of the state. Our first forgotten ancestors left this tradition behind them, and our own latest fathers and mothers a few years ago would have thought us lunatics to be discussing it. The shortest general definition of eugenics on its practical side is that it does, in more or less degree, propose to control some families at least, as if they were families of pagan slaves. I shall discuss later the question of the people to whom this pressure may be applied, and the much more puzzling question of what people will apply it. But it is to be applied, at the very least, by somebody to somebody, and that on certain calculations about breeding, which are affirmed to be demonstrable. So much for the subject itself. I say that this thing exists. I define it as closely as matters involving moral evidence can be defined. I call it eugenics. If, after that, anyone chooses to say that eugenics is not the Greek for this, I am content to answer that chivalrous is not the French for horsey, and that such controversial games are more horsey than chivalrous. Thank you for listening to Eugenics and Other Evils by G. K. Chesterton, read by me, David Grizzly Smith. Theme music for the book is Showdown by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. This book is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 license. That means please make copies, please share this book, but don't change it don't sell it, and do tell people where you got it. If you like this book, leave a comment and a rating on potiobooks.com or comment on grizzliesgrowls.com or anywhere else you can. Blog about it, podcast about it, tweet about it, tell everyone. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to Grizzly Scrowls, the life and times of a minor local celebrity. If you like the show, tell your friends. If you don't like the show, tell your enemies. If this podcast lasts more than four hours, see your doctor. Theme music is Hot Swing from Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or at feeds.feedburner.com slash grizzliesgrowls. Comment at grizzly.libsyn.com or by voicemail at the comment line 218-234-CALL. That's 218-234-2255. These shows are released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 License. Your mileage may vary. Thank you.